A very good morning to everybody out there. I see people are still uh, trickling in. Uh, so what we will do is, uh, as usual, we will start the day with questions. Alluri Institute, Varangal, please go ahead. What is FTP servlet? Uh, servlet can uh, support many different protocols. And uh, FTP could uh, potentially be one of them. Uh, so um, we use HTTP servlet as the class from which we inherited. So that particular uh, servlet implements the HTTP protocol. You can have other servlets for other protocols. Uh, FTP would be one of them. So uh, these protocols differ in exactly what kind of messages are exchanged, what exactly uh, happens when a message is received, and so forth. Sir, uh, next question, sir. Yeah. Uh, which is the database that will support type 2 driver, sir? Can you give an example for that? Uh, you're type talking of type driver. 2 JDBC drivers, type 1, type 2. Uh, this is not really an issue which you need to worry about. Um, you know, unless you're getting deep into the internals of how things are implemented, you don't care whether it's a type 1 or type 2 driver. So you're best not worrying about which database is supported. But uh, since you asked, uh, when JDBC was first introduced, uh, ODBC was already very widely supported. And the initial uh, drivers for JDBC uh, were actually bridges, meaning that uh, they would talk ODBC protocol with the backend. And uh, you could have a database with an ODBC driver and then a JDBC driver which would connect to the ODBC service. Uh, later on, uh, there were native JDBC drivers, which would avoid this overhead of going via ODBC and uh, directly communicate with, the, it would be, uh, the driver would be part of the database system and could support JDBC. Uh, I don't remember which is type 1, which is type 2. If I'm not mistaken, type 1 is the old bridge and type 2 is the direct, I, I don't remember this, it's been a while, uh, partly because it really doesn't matter these days. Okay, we are with. Uh, uh, KIT College, Shirgaon. Please go ahead. Sir, my question is about TR diagram. Okay. Uh, uh, the most important question uh, in uh, ER diagram is to finding out uh, entities uh, where most of the students get confused. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you uh, suggest any any such uh, mechanism? Uh, which will make uh, them much more easier to find out which are entities, which are relations, and when they are forming this uh, uh, your schema diagram, mm. then what can be converted into tables, what can be converted into columns? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. How do you decide uh, what is an entity, what is a relationship? Uh, I don't know if there is a science to it. Uh, it's more of an art, but there are some guiding principles. So uh, when you want to model a particular enterprise, if you think of what are the things that you want to model at an abstract level, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, let's take an example like Facebook. What are the things that Facebook stores? It stores people. It stores uh, post things made by people. It stores photographs uploaded by people. Um, I believe now it even uh, has, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it has not just people, but also companies now, which are Facebook users. So then it has uh, likes, uh, you know, who likes what and so on. So you can first put down all of these things in just text, English or whatever language you choose. Uh, just note down whatever you want to model without starting on the ER modeling phase. First write down what all are the things that you want to model? And what are all the interfaces which you have? So if you see our, um, uh, the format, uh, sample format which we are given for the project, it also starts off that way. It doesn't jump straight into ER design because if you say, okay, uh, here is an enterprise, create an ER design, uh, you are at a loss as to what is to be done. So don't get into ER design, work at an even higher level first. Describe what are the things that you want to model in English, at this point, don't worry about whether they're entities or relationships. You'll get a good handle on uh, what all you want to model. By the time you're done with this stage, uh, it will uh, come more naturally to you uh, whether something should be an entity or a relationship. So first of all, the entities can be recognized as things that uh, have an existence of their own, independent of others. Uh, so in the Facebook example, uh, 
user, whether it's a, a person or a company or whoever, would be an entity. A photo would also be an entity. A post made by a user would probably be modeled as an entity also. Um, what about uh, someone liking something? Should that be an entity? Should that be a relationship? Uh, th that is uh, something which uh, you know, should be reasonably clear in this case. Uh, a person is commenting on a post. So it's a connection between the person and the post. So that's probably a relationship. Uh, what about the friendship? Uh, a person is a friend with somebody else. That's probably a relationship. Uh, what about a friend request? When somebody sends out a request to somebody else saying, uh, I want to be friends with you. Is that a relationship or is that an entity? Uh, when somebody sends it out, it's not, uh, you could model it perhaps as a relationship which is want to be friends relationship. And when the other person replies, maybe it become friends or maybe it gets deleted. Or you could model it as an entity which is a request. Uh, which is originated by someone, it's related to someone, it's, re, uh, it's related to someone else who is the uh, person you're requesting. It may have other attributes, which may also be okay. Uh, at certain times, it's not absolutely clear whether something should be an entity or a relationship. And uh, in some such, many such cases, I would say, uh, whichever choice you make when you convert it to relation, you might probably land up at the same place anyway. So uh, sometimes it doesn't matter too much. Uh, you can do it either way. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, uh, the next thing is uh, when you are converting that into tables, hmm. uh, sometimes we take all the, uh, we create the tables for each and every entity. That is for right. sure. Well, yeah, while designing the database. Right. And so we, we include right. some of the relations uh, for tables, right. Well. And some some of these relations are not considered when we are creating the tables. So uh, that is another confusing uh, thing for students uh, to identify which relations uh, have to be converted into tables and which are not. Uh, actually, I would uh, disagree with the uh, saying that some relationships are not converted to tables. What happens is that they get folded into other tables. Every relationship has to be represented in the relational model also. It's not optional. The only question is, do you create a separate table for it or uh, do you just fold it into one of the other tables so it becomes an attribute of that table. Uh, so the algorithm for uh, converting um, a near diagram to tables uh, I think makes this reasonably clear. Uh, if it's a many to one relationship, then you have the option of folding it into the uh, entity uh, which is on the many side. And um, if it's not uh, total participation, then you might uh, you want to consider the fact that you will have null values. Uh, and then that choice uh, could be made in different ways. Uh, if it is something which you expect many people to be involved in, if not all, it might be okay to have a few null values. If it's a relationship which you expect very few people to be involved in, um, then uh, you might not make it an attribute, you might just keep it as a separate relation. So th th there's nothing wrong in keeping it as a separate relation, but you have the option of folding it in. Uh, it's partly an efficiency issue and partly an issue of how many different uh, relations do you want to create. But it would still be correct to create a separate relation for it. It's not incorrect. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll take one last question and then move on to today's topic. Okay, we are with uh, Srinath Ji Institute of Technology, Rajasthan. Okay, what is the difference between web server and application server? Okay. So, I think I had answered this question yesterday. Uh, the uh, difference between it is kind of blurred uh, these days. Uh, but originally, a web server's sole goal was to serve files. And to execute programs which are, I mean, there are certain files which are executable. Um, and uh, files in a particular directory are treated as things that should be executed and the output of it should be returned to the user. That's originally all that web servers did. Application servers, on the other hand, run uh, programs in Java or PHP or whatever. Uh, and their uh, primary goal is to run these things. Serving uh, files which are stored in a file system is secondary for these. Uh, but things have changed. Uh, if you see uh, web servers today, Apache, 
it has modules which let it run uh, PHP as part of the web server. Uh, if you see uh, application servers like Tomcat, they have pretty good ser support for serving HTTP files and uh, things related to that. So the uh, boundary is uh, blurred these days, but uh, at, at the core you still have um, HTTP uh, web, web servers uh, at the entry point to any organization. And uh, typically their goal is to route request to wherever they should go. So you go to Google, uh, for example, it's a, you're just going to google.com or gmail.com. Uh, but uh, there are a huge number of application servers. So usually they have a, a number of front ends, so you might go to any one of them, and the front end will actually reroute your request to a suitable back end. Uh, in fact, there are many front end web servers, and then at the back end there are many application server instances, and there's some routing going on. So uh, here web servers are used primarily as plain web servers. Uh, and most uh, places have uh, web servers because uh, the primary goal is to serve files. Uh, application servers are uh, a little less common because they are providing services as opposed to just providing information. Okay, I think we'll uh, stop the questions here and move on to uh, today's topic. So the first topic for today is uh, storage and uh, file structures. And after that, we'll move on to indexing and uh, Hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for query processing. So uh, our first goal is to understand uh, the uh, physical issues with uh, storage, because that has a huge influence on how data is stored about. If you look uh, back in history, the original storage medium was tapes. Uh, data processing started with uh, tapes as a storage medium. And the whole area of data processing focused on how to get data from uh, one tape get updates to another, merge it to get a third tape, how to get data on um, multiple tapes, uh, sort them and merge them into one tape, and so forth. It was all focused on tapes. When hard disks came in, uh, data processing changed its character, and uh, the systems that were built very strongly reflect the technology which is hard disk. And the physical characteristics of hard disks have had a huge impact on the design of database systems. Today, there's another revolution underway where for many, many applications, uh, flash uh, memory is more than big enough uh, to store all data. And a hard disk is needed only for other kinds of uh, data, such as video, audio, uh, large uh, uh, text files, images, and big data, which is data collected by uh, big uh, um, you know, web uh, services across the world, and then maybe provided to other people who make use of that data. But if you're an organization and uh, you are uh, just managing your, uh, the data of your students and employees and so forth, it handily fits in Flash. In fact, today it's come to the point where it not only handily fits in Flash, but it handily fits in uh, main memory. So uh, th there's a lot of emphasis these days on database systems that are optimized for main memory. We don't have time to get into it, uh, but we should just be aware that the underlying storage plays a big role. So to understand uh, the characteristics of storage devices, we have cache and main memory at the top, which are called primary storage, and they are volatile. When you switch off the computer, they're gone. The next uh, layers down all the way to the bottom are non-volatile in that if you switch off power, they still retain data. Of these, uh, the uh, highest level is flash, which is uh, not quite as fast as main memory for reads, and uh, quite a lot slower for writes. And below that is magnetic disk, which is a lot slower than main memory and flash for both reads and writes. Uh, but what do I mean by a lot slower? Uh, what I mean is that if you initiate a read or a write, it takes a while for it to complete. But if you're reading a large amount of contiguous data, it turns out that magnetic disk is not so bad. In fact, it can be as fast or faster than flash in some cases. Uh, so th these two are called secondary storage. I'll come back to characteristics of disk and flash. And tertiary storage is much slower, and it consists of optical disks, uh, DVD, you know, writable DVDs, uh, Blu-ray, or whatever. And uh, the largest uh, capacities are, have and are still in the form of magnetic tape. Uh, but the uh, drawback to magnetic tape in particular is if you want to access a particular uh, piece of data, it may be somewhere in the middle of a tape, and it may take minutes to just wind the tape to the right point. 
And if the tape is not loaded, it may take even more time to load the tape. So those are called tertiary. And they are used primarily for backup. You don't use it for live data these days. You use it as a backup. In case there's a problem with live data, you can restore it from backup. To understand the physical characteristics of this, here is a schematic diagram. It's not uh, supposed to be a real, uh, really how this look. They don't look like this at all. Uh, but it uh, gives it a basic thing schematically. The basic thing is that this have uh, these platters. Each thing is called a platter. And a hard disk drive usually has several platters. At one time, there used to be uh, 10, 12 platters. These days, it's come down drastically to two or three platters. Now, each platter, uh, you know, the whole thing is on a spindle which rotates like this. Uh, or rather, in this diagram, it's shown the other way. It's rotating clockwise. doesn't matter which way. And then there is a, a read-write head which can read and write data on this uh, magnetic surface. And that is attached to an arm assembly here, which can swing. This diagram uh, doesn't show it very well, uh, but the arm basically swings across. It can uh, position the read-write head, head close to the center of the disk, or it can swing out and position it closer to the edge of the disk. Now, if it's positioned at a particular point, the disk is spinning. So the parts of the disk that come under the uh, read-write head, at that, uh, once the arm is stable, form a track. Now, the way a disk is organized, there are multiple tracks. And the read-write head is supposed to come to rest exactly over a track, not in between tracks. When it's exactly over a track, it can read all the data that is, has been written on the track. It can write onto that track also. Now, the information in a track is usually broken into small pieces called sectors. Uh, why sectors? Uh, sector uh, basically has uh, some identifying information. And then it has a checksum. And the goal of this checksum is to make sure that when you write data, if you read it back, if there is an error during reading, it's detected. The checksum is basically some function of the rest of the bytes in that sector. And if there was a problem writing those bytes, the checksum uh, will most probably, with very high probability, will not match the contents of that sector. And you know it was not written properly. And what actually happens is, as soon as a write is done, uh, the disk actually waits for the thing to, supposing you wrote this sector uh, here, this sector. Uh, the system waits for the disk to spin around. The sector comes back, and it is read again. So whatever was written is immediately read back and compared. If what was uh, written earlier does not match what was just read, then there is a problem. And the uh, disk system tries to write it again. Uh, what if it fails again? Uh, usually there are some mechanisms to uh, remap bad sectors to some other place in the disk. And it would go and write the data there. Assuming that this particular piece of the disk surface has been spoiled for some reason. And this does happen some, uh, periodically. So all disks have set aside a few sectors for remapping bad sectors. Uh, again, some terminology. A track is a complete circle here. A sector is a piece of it. A cylinder is all the tracks which are one above the other on the different platter. Because they can all be read at the same time uh, from, uh, without moving the disk arm. No, well, not at the same time. The disk can choose to read this, this read-write head or the next one or the next one and so forth. But you don't have to move the arm assembly. So that's a physical characteristic. Now there are some uh, characteristics with regard to the time it takes to do various actions. The access time is the time it takes from when a read-write request is issued to the disk to the time when the data transfer actually begins. And uh, this has two components. Uh, the first is the seek time, which is the time it takes to reposition the arm over the correct track. So the arm is at some track. It has to move to an inner track or an outer track, depending on the request. So how long does this take? Uh, this depends uh, very much on where the arm is with respect to uh, which track you are asking for. If it's on the same track, it's zero. If it is somewhere else, it takes some time. So what you want is an average. Assuming the arm is at any uh, uh, random position, um, what is the average time it takes to reach where you want? Now it turns out that um, the outer tracks of the disk actually have more sectors than the inner tracks because of physical characteristics of 
how many bits you can store in a particular uh, in per uh, cent linear centimeter of magnetic material. And uh, so the disk arm tends to be positioned towards outer tracks. It's not uniform. And in fact, uh, some tricks to reduce the seek time include not even using the inner tracks. Just use the a few outer tracks, so the arm movement is very restricted. And it's anywhere between 4 to 10 milliseconds for typical disks. And then there's a rotational latency, uh, which is uh, the time it takes for the sector to rotate and come under the arm. So the arm has moved, but at this point, the sector may be here, which means it will be a full rotation before it comes under the arm. Or if the sector is just before, it will come underneath very soon. So again, there is an average, which is half of the worst case rotational time, and it's 4 to uh, 11 milliseconds on typical disks. Uh, so if you take the uh, combination of these on, uh, you know, medium uh, disks, typical uh, desktop disks, you might get of the order of uh, 10 to 15 milliseconds. On higher end disks, you would get smaller things, up as low as maybe 5 uh, milliseconds or so on average. Once you uh, got to the right point, you can start reading data. And now the data flows uh, as fast as the uh, rotational speed of the disk and the density with which data is stored allow. And the typical values these days are 25 to 100 megabytes per second. It's more for outer tracks, lower for inner tracks. So now uh, there's one other important m uh, measure for disk, which is how long is it going to take before the disk fails? Uh, disks these days are pretty good, uh, but all of you, I'm sure, have seen at least one disk failure. And uh, the typical uh, life of a disk these days is something like three to five years. It's actually been improving slowly. Uh, it used to be a lot worse. And uh, the th thing is that when a disk is very new, it has a higher probability of failure. Actually, manufacturers have taken this into account, and these days, before they even ship the disk to you, they have run it for a fair amount of time in their uh, facility. So what you get are disks which have already been run for some time. So any um, manufacturing defect shows up while they are testing it over a period of time, before they even pack it and ship it to you. The other thing is, as a disk grows older, when it's, uh, say, five years, the probability of failure increases a lot more. Uh, whereas when the disk is new and past its burn-in period, the probability of failure is much less. So what manufacturers quote is the uh, mean time to failure for a new disk which they ship you. And uh, that reflects, uh, it's basically inversely related to the probability that the disk will fail. Uh, supposing uh, you have a mean time to failure for a new disk of, uh, let's say, one million hours. What does that mean? It means if you buy one million of these disks, you can expect one of them to fail in the next hour. If you buy a thousand of these disks, you can expect one of them to fail in the next thousand hours. If you buy a hundred of these disks, you can expect one of them to fail in the next 10,000 hours. Uh, but then that fails uh, too much. If, if you can't buy one disk and say, I expect it to last for a million hours, it may not. As it grows older, its uh, mean time to failure starts dropping, and after some age, the probability that it will fail becomes pretty high. Okay, so that was hard disk. Uh, the next uh, issue, uh, we'll, by the way, we'll come back to this issue of what to do if a disk fails. Uh, there's a technology called RAID which deals with it. Now let's move to flash disks, which are becoming increasingly important. Uh, there's actually two kinds of flash, NOR and NAND flash. You don't hear much about NOR flash these days, although that was the more common thing uh, in earlier days. NAND flash is the cheaper kind of flash, which all of us use extensively. All our pen drives are based on NAND flash. And uh, interestingly, the way they made uh, NAND flash cheaper was to remove byte addressability. So NOR flash basically was byte addressable, much like memory. You can give a specific byte, and it will read just that byte, or, or a few uh, bytes around that byte. NAND flash, on the other hand, actually requires you to read a whole page, which is like maybe uh, 5, 12 bytes uh, to a few kilobytes worth of data at one go. You can't access just one byte. 
there is a process where those it's like a train you you have to be at the head of the train and the train you can only read the data as the train goes past you you can't uh, go to any random compartment in the train one page is like a train so you have to pull out the whole train from the uh, flash uh, media and then read the bytes that you want from the middle of the train so that's kind of like hard disk because you have, there also you have to read a sector at a minimum in fact uh, there's a notion of a page which is a higher level concept and the database system typically does not deal with individual sector they are too small it deals with individual pages operating systems also do the same thing they have their own notion of page size a database can have its own uh, call on how big a page should be it's usually multiple sectors uh now the uh, if you take a single uh, flash memory uh, device its uh, read and write speeds are not all that fast they are uh, maybe a few megabytes per second it's actually much slower than hard disk but uh, these days uh, what people do is they uh, put together a number of these flash uh, chips into one uh, solid state disk so a solid state disk offers an interface uh, which is similar to hard disk i didn't talk about the interfaces uh, there are what are called sata which is very common today and then there is scsi and a few other interfaces so a uh, uh, solid state disk looks just like a magnetic disk um, the only difference is uh, that a uh, when you want to read a particular block uh, the seek time is much much slower uh, on a hard disk i told you that the seek plus the rotational latency might be of the order of 5 to 15 milliseconds on a flash disk uh, the time to read a random page is much slower you are looking at probably uh, 100 microseconds or less to read a whole page and that's much faster than 10 milliseconds okay that's uh, of the order of 100 times faster uh, what about writes it turns out that you can't actually go and physically overwrite a page on flash without first doing an operation called erase so it's like a whiteboard once you've written something on it you have to go erase it before you can write anything more and the thing is with flash erase erase is slow erase can take one or two milliseconds which is now almost of the order of magnitude of a uh, hard disk write uh, by the way the random page read i said is 100 microseconds it can be even less depending on the flash device you might get it in something like one or two microseconds even 100 is uh, kind of worst case scenario but uh, for writes you can if the page is erased already you can write reasonably fast uh, it's comparable to uh, read speed as little bit slower but if you need to erase the page then it's a lot slower so if you have already got data and you have to wait 2 milliseconds for the page to be erased that's a long wait but what is interesting is that the erase is not done at the unit of a page it's done at the unit of what is called a block which is many pages so many pages can be erased in parallel but a block erase takes the same time as a single page erase which is a 1 or 2 milliseconds so this is a weird characteristic uh, hard disks are not like this so uh, to deal with this problem Uh, what uh, flash uh, devices have is a piece of software running on top called the flash translation layer if you see here flash translation layer what does it do it one of the things it does is it remaps sectors so you wrote a sector some time back uh, now you want to overwrite it you don't want to spend time erasing it so the trick is you will write it to a new location which is already clean so it's like i have a lot of uh, blackboards i have written on one blackboard and when i need to write more i kind of uh, jump to another blackboard and say okay now uh, you know that blackboard used to be called physical location 1000 now i'm going to another blackboard and from now on the new blackboard is called physical location 1000 so you are actually remapping uh, pages uh, to a new physical uh, location underneath as far as the operating system is concerned it's the same physical page number but the flash device itself knows that it's physically in a different place on the device so we need a mapping uh, between the uh, physical location and the page number and this mapping is stored in what is called a translation table 
So all of this is hidden from you, the flash translation layer does this. So this is part of the device driver for a flash. If you plug a USB key in, there is a device driver uh, which does all of this. And the translation table itself is stored on the um, pen drive itself or on the solid state disk. So your pen drives are slow, but solid state disks are much faster. Another weird thing about flash is that if you keep writing and erasing the same um, page over and over again or, or, or the same block, if you keep erasing a block, after some time there is physical damage to the block and the reliability goes down. And so manufacturers uh, put a limit on how many times you can erase a block. If you erase it more than that many times, they will say, look, this block won't be reliable anymore and they will remove it from the system in effect. So your, uh, the size of your flash device just shrank a little bit because that particular uh, block is removed from uh, the active blocks uh, set. So if you keep reading and writing the same block over and over again, you have a problem. Uh, 100, so how many erases is this? 100,000 to 1 million is considered common these days. Uh, this might improve. There have been some advances in this field, but it used to be as low as 10,000. Now, how long does it take to uh, erase a single block 100,000 times? With uh, 1 millisecond per erase, in 100 milliseconds, you can destroy a block. Okay, so that's pretty quick. So you can uh, busily destroy blocks at the rate of uh, you know, 10 blocks per second. You can completely wipe them out by erasing them too many times. Um, but remember, the uh, size of a uh, flash device is very big, it's gigabytes. It has um, millions of blocks. So what you want to do is kind of uh, spread the uh, distress around. So give every block a chance to get erased a few times and if it has uh, been erased multiple times, uh, try not to erase it again. How do you avoid erasing it again? There is a trick. Data is usually uh, divided into hot regions and cold regions. Hot regions are regions which keep getting overwritten. Cold regions are regions which have some data which doesn't change at all for a long time. And the trick is uh, you remap these uh, blocks which have been erased many times and use them to store cold data. And the block which was used to store cold data can now uh, be used for hot data and maybe it will get erased a number of times and then it may get uh, moved away to, uh, you, to store cold data. All of this stuff, which is called wear leveling, is again taken care of by the FTL. With wear leveling, you usually don't see any degradation in the capacity of the device for a long time. But eventually, of course, it will catch up. But that eventually is many years. And by then, uh, you anyway have probably junked your system and bought a new one, or at least the disk. Now, failures can happen with any medium. Hard disks can fail. Flash uh, devices can also fail. In fact, uh, inside of a flash device, the probability of failure is much, much higher than a magnetic medium. Uh, so what do flash devices do about this? It turns out that internal to the flash device itself, uh, they have a mechanism of, which is similar to the RAID mechanism, which we are going to look at just now. And you can also build RAID on top of a flash device. Um, but let's just focus on magnetic device. It, do, it doesn't really matter. RAID can be built on top of any disk, whether magnetic or solid state. So the idea of RAID, uh, RAID uh, stands for redundant arrays of independent disks. Um, originally, it stood for redundant arrays of uh, uh, inexpensive disks. So disks which are cheap, as opposed to more reliable, expensive disks. These days, uh, disks are all the same, more or less the same price. The, there is a price difference between uh, desktop class and enterprise class. Uh, so you could use desktop class disks in a RAID array and get uh, more reliability. So how do you do this? Uh, well, there are two parts. There is uh, high reliability, which you get by storing data redundantly, maybe multiple copies or other means. And high capacity by using multiple disks in parallel. So if you want to... Uh, you know, store data at the rate of uh, gigabytes per second, a uh, hard disk which can store 100 megabytes per second is not going to keep up with the load. Uh, so what you do is have multiple of these hard disks working in parallel and you suddenly have the capacity to store gigabytes per second. 
Now, if you uh, the second part reliability it turns out to be very, very important, even more important than the uh, high speed. Uh, so, if you have a system with 100 disks, each with a mean time to failure of 100,000 hours, which is approximately 11 years, then uh, you will have a mean time to failure of some disk in this array of 100 disks, which is 1000 hours or 41 days. So, imagine every 41 days there is a hard disk failure, which brings your system down and loses and you lose data. That is a disaster. So, what you want to do is uh, somehow uh, avoid losing data. And the simplest, uh, whatever you need to do to avoid losing data requires some amount of redundancy, storing extra information that can be used to rebuild information that is lost in a disk failure. Now, this might sound weird. Uh, we just spent a lot of time on normalization saying that redundancy is a bad thing. Uh, duplication is bad, let us design a schema which avoids duplication. And here we are coming back and saying uh, we need redundancy to avoid failures. And this is consistent actually. You do not want redundancy at the logical level because then you have a problem. You have multiple copies, you do not know which is correct. This on the other hand is at the physical layer. And you know exactly where the copy is. If a failure happens, you are going to use that copy to restore it. And you know, uh, you meaning the RAID system knows exactly uh, where the copy is. So, if you update something, the copy will also get updated automatically. You, the programmer, do not have to worry about this. So, the simplest way of redundancy is mirroring or shadowing, uh, in that you just duplicate every disk. Whatever you write to disk uh, copy 1, you also write to copy 2. When you read, you can read from either copy. So, a pair of disks looks logically like a single disk. There are two physical disks which look like one logical disk. If one of the disks fails, uh, since everything which you wrote was also written on the other disk, you can continue running using just the other disk. Of course, if you keep running for a long time, uh, there is a chance that the other disk will also fail. So, uh, what you want to do is repair the broken disk as fast as possible, replace it, and then restore it by copying data from the good disk to the uh, new blank disk which you just plugged in. So, uh, the mean time to data loss, that is how long can you expect the system to run before uh, there is actual data loss. When is there actual data loss? A disk failed and before you could uh, replace and repair it and, and restore it, the other copy also failed. So, how, what is the probability of that happening? It depends on two things. It depends on the mean time to uh, failure, which we have already seen. It also depends on the mean time to repair. That is, how fast can you uh, replace the disk and restore it, the data on that disk. So, if you take a long time to repair, the chance of data loss goes up sharply. If you can repair it fast, the mean time to data, uh, the chance of data loss goes down, mean time to data loss increases correspondingly. So, a trick which is widely used in most RAID systems is to keep a spare disk. The moment the system finds a disk has died, it is going to uh, restore all the data from the um, mirror disk onto the spare disk. Now, uh, humans are informed and told that look a disk died, uh, please come and replace that disk as soon as possible, but it is not an emergency. You do not have to come in the middle of the night to replace it, you can come tomorrow. You can do it uh, once a week. And this is a principle which most uh, companies which run big data centers, uh, they uh, do not go and replace failed disks immediately. They always keep spare disks. And once a week, they will walk through the array and find all the disks which have failed, pull them out and replace them by new disks, which will become the new spare. In case a failure occurs, that will be used as the spare. Okay, so that is uh, that's a basic idea of mirroring. Uh, but you do not have to just mirror, there is an alternative which is called um, parity, which is also widely used. Um, so, uh, before we come to parity, let us also talk of striping. If you want higher uh, disk throughputs, you want to be able to store data at a faster rate, read data at a faster rate, what you do is stripe blocks across disk. So, if you have a file, block 1 may go to disk 1, block 2 to disk 2, block 3 to disk 3 and so forth. And then you do round robin and start off again. Now, after you have exhausted the disk, you go back to disk 1, store the next block and so forth. What is the benefit of this? 
supposing I want to read blocks 1 to 1000. Now, this 1 will read blocks 1 and then maybe block 11, 21, 31 and so on. This 2 will read block 2, 12, 22, 32, I am assuming 10 disks. And all of this will happen in parallel. So, I will get the uh, throughput of 10 disks running in parallel uh, and I can get very high throughputs that way. So, this is called block level striping. The ith block of a file goes to disk i mod n plus 1. The plus 1 is because I am numbering this from 1 onwards. Now, I mentioned parity. What is parity? It is simply the XOR function applied to a set of bits. And in this case, uh, it is applied to bits of corresponding blocks. So, supposing I have um, blocks in disk 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. On the sixth disk, if I assume an array of six disks, I can store a XOR of the bits of blocks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, blocks, uh, sorry, I am assuming 5 disks with data, 1 with parity. Let me restart this. I think I might have confused you. There are 5 blocks with, uh, 5 disks with actual data and 1 disk with parity. So, blocks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 go to disk 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. On disk 6, the first block will be the XOR of the corresponding bits of blocks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Similarly, blocks 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 will go to disk 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the 6th disk will store the parity which is the XOR of blocks 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and so forth. This is one particular scheme. You can improve on this as we will see. But the idea is if one of the disks fails, we know which disk has failed. How do you reconstruct the data in the blocks of that disk? It turns out supposing the uh, second disk failed. How do I reconstruct block 2? It is actually very simple. Uh, the XOR function is symmetric. So, what I do is um, I will take the XOR of blocks 1, 3, 4, 5 and the corresponding parity block which is on the 6th disk. If I XOR the bits of those, it will give me back the uh, bits of block 2 which is on the failed disk. I do not have that block, but I can reconstruct it by XORing the corresponding blocks. So, that is the trick to parity. So, there are many uh, uh, options, many ways of doing parity and so forth and uh, researchers uh, came up with some uh, nomenclature which differentiates this. This is what is called rate 0 which is block level striping no redundancy. You just stripe the blocks across the disk. So, if I have uh, 4 disks here, block 1, 2, 3, 4 go here, 5, 6, 7, 8 and so forth. Just go round and round, you can get higher throughput, but if a disk fails, you lose data. RAID 1 is mirrored disk with block striping, that is you can stripe data to uh, these 4 disks and these 4 disks are an exact copy of the first 4 disks. Now, in the uh, research community, uh, RAID 1 refers to this thing, but in the industry, many people call this uh, RAID 1 plus 0 or sometimes people also have something called RAID 0 plus 1 with some very minor differences, which we will ignore. So, if you see RAID 1 plus 0 or RAID 1 0 in industrial literature, it refers to this thing, mirrored disk with block striping. And correspondingly, in, in the industry, RAID 1 sometimes is used to refer to mirrored disk with no striping at all. Uh, then there are RAID levels 2, 3, 4, which we are going to ignore because nobody uses them. Uh, RAID 5 is very widely used also. And this is what is called block interleaved distributed parity, uh, which basically does the following. So, uh, I have an array of 5 disks and the parity blocks are distributed across the disk. So, here is a schematic. Um, here I have numbered blocks from 0 onwards. Data blocks 0, 1, 2, 3 are on these disks and the corresponding block on the very first disk is the parity of these 4, the XOR of these 4 blocks. Now, for the next set of 4 blocks, the parity is not on the first disk, it goes to the second disk and the data blocks are here 4, 5, 6, 7 and on the third disk, the data on the third block rather, the data blocks are on 8 are here, 8, 9, 10, 11 are here, 
parity is here and so forth. Uh, now, if you go to blocks uh, 20 onwards, this whole pattern will repeat again. Parity uh, block number 5 will be here, block 20 will be here, 21, 22, 23 and so forth. The pattern repeats. Why do we do this? Why not just store all the parity blocks on one disk? So, it turns out that when you write any piece of data, if you write block 5, uh, you have to write block 5, but you also have to update parity block P1. When you write block 10, you have to update parity block P2 also. Now, supposing all the parity blocks were on one disk, any write to any of the other disks will also require a write to this disk. And what you will see very soon is that there is a long queue of writes for this disk, while all the other disks are running at let us say one fourth of their capacity, they are idle most of the time. The trick of uh, spreading the parity blocks across all the disks speeds this up in the sense that uh, all the bliss disks have uh, parity block writes coming to them. So, the load is leveled across disks. So, there is a choice of different RAID levels. Uh, RAID uh, 1 or and 5 are the most common today. You would use RAID 1 if uh, your application did not need to store all that much data, uh, but you wanted very fast reads and writes. But if you are storing a lot of data and uh, you worry about the cost of disk, you would use RAID 5. Why? Should be clear when you go back to this picture. In RAID 5, for 4 blocks, I had 1 parity block. In fact, I could push this even more. I can have 8 data uh, blocks with 1 parity block. Uh, the more I push it, the uh, more chance I have of uh, loss of data, but I can go to 8 without too much problem. So, the overhead of storing redundant data, the parity blocks is much lower in RAID 5. In RAID 1, for every disk, there is a mirror disk. So, the overheads are quite a bit higher. Uh, but uh, strangely enough, what ha happened after some time is that, uh, you know, people found that in many cases, it is not the capacity of a disk. The capacity of disk has exploded over time. You know, some years back, we were getting by with uh, 1 GB disk. Um, when I uh, was finishing my undergrad, a 10 megabyte disk was considered a large disk for a desktop. And that evolved from 10 megabytes to 100 to gigabyte to now a terabyte is considered standard. So, disk capacity is not the issue. But if you see the number of I.O. operations that a disk can do, uh, back in that era, uh, the uh, figure was something like 30 milliseconds to uh, do a read and uh, or write to a random location. Today, it is maybe 10 milliseconds. So, in an era when the disk capacity has gone from 10 megabytes to a terabyte, uh, which is a huge explosion, um, uh, 100,000 times capacity, the speed at which I can retrieve a random block has improved only by a factor of 3. So, that is terrible. So, the bottleneck these days is not the capacity, but for a given workload, how many I O operations can I perform on the disk in a given amount of time? That is often the bottleneck. So, even though RAID level 1 is wasteful in terms of disk, it turns out it is a lot better in terms of number of I O operations to do a single write. If I do a write uh, on uh, RAID 1, I just write 2 blocks and that is it. Uh, but if I want to do a write on RAID 5, I usually have to read the parity block and then write it back also. So, not only do I have to do, uh, in fact, I have to read the old block, read the old parity block and then write the 2 things. So, what I land up with is 2 reads and 2 writes as opposed to uh, 2 writes without a read in the context of um, the RAID 1. So, RAID 5 is actually more wasteful in terms of I O operations required. So, it turns out for many applications, RAID 1 is much better than RAID 5, uh, given that hard disk capacities are so large. But RAID 5 is good when you do not update data much. So, if you are storing uh, video data, YouTube and so forth, uh, it is totally wasteful to have more disks with RAID 1, you would go with RAID 5. Lastly, some uh, other terminology. There is what is called software RAID versus hardware RAID. Software RAID is RAID which is implemented completely in your 
operating system drivers. Hardware read on the other hand uh, is uh, built into some lower layer and the key thing in hardware read is it uses a small amount of non-volatile RAM which could be battery backed up RAM or even flash disk to record writes that are being executed. Now why is this important? Uh, supposing you are on a RAID system and you are, had to write a block. If you wrote the block simultaneously on both disks and a power failure happened in the middle of a block write, you could be in a situation where both the blocks are corrupted, both copies of the block are corrupted. The disk did not fail, it is just that a power failure happened in the middle of a write. Now there are ways around this. Uh, but it slows things down. So what you can uh, do instead is store the data which you are writing in a non-volatile RAM. If a failure like this happens, when you come back up from failure, you simply take that pending write which you have recorded in non-volatile RAM and complete it, write it to both the disks. So it does not matter if a failure happened in the middle of a block write, it will get completed when you recover. Um, so it is a lot more efficient to do this if you have a small amount of NVRAM supporting this. This is not usually done in software read. So there is a higher chance of data loss with software read. And finally some more terminology. Uh, in the uh, you know original uh, computer systems disks were stored inside the computers, were attached inside the computer system. Today that is true of your desktops. But many enterprises have now started decoupling the disks subsystem from the um, actual uh, computer uh, CPU plus memory hardware. So what they do is uh, they have what is called a storage area network. So you have a number of disks which are actually connected to a subsystem which does RAID and other stuff. And you connect this uh, storage area, uh, storage systems over a kind of network called a storage area network. You connect it to the computer using this thing. Um, now what is the benefit of this? The benefit is that these uh, storage subsystems are, do not do anything except manage storage and they are a lot more reliable because they do not do anything else. On the other hand, your uh, CPU with high performance, lots of memory uh, is more vulnerable to failure. But by separating it out, you have uh, ensured that if a CPU fails, it does not matter. Just bring up another CPU, uh, which is uh, loading the same operating system data and everything from the disk, which is now separate. It is on the network. So you get much higher reliability by storing all your information in a storage area network rather than on a local disk. And with the rise of uh, uh, virtual machine, VMs, uh, this is push the trend along further because it is very easy to bring up a, a virtual machine on a new piece of hardware. So if one piece of hardware fails, uh, that VM would also be stored on the storage area network disk. So you can just read the VM from the disk and restore it on a new computer extremely fast. <clears throat> so you can mask failures more or less. People will just see a very short outage. Now what about the disk in the storage area network itself? They can fail. So these disk subsystems implement RAID of course and uh, they, are, they will let you hot swap the disk while the system is running. They will rebuild the failed disk. They will even let you add capacity by adding more disks on the fly without bringing anything down. So they are widely used these days. They are also horribly expensive. Um, they cost uh, like 10 times or more the price of a regular disk subsystem. But people are still willing to pay that price. There is also something called network attached storage, uh, which is uh, basically uh, the uh, Unix NFS or the Windows uh, SMB uh, system, which lets you store files on a remote file server. You cannot get a, you know, disk level access, but you can open files, write to files and so on. So these are also widely used. Okay, so that is the underlying storage. Now let us move up one layer and see how uh, databases store data on, on disks. So typically a database stores data as a collection of files. Now what are these files? They could be operating system files and then the database leaves the 
uh, management of the files, meaning which blocks are in the file, how do you add a block to the file, how do you find the ith block of the file, all that is left to the operating system. So when you install Postgres or MySQL, they do exactly this, they leave it to the operating system. However, high performance databases uh, are usually tailored to bypass the operating system and to work directly from uh, the blocks on disk. The advantage of doing this is that one uh, layer of software, the operating system is bypassed and the database can better control what data goes where, what data is kept in cache, what is not and so forth. Uh, let's not worry about this distinction here and we will assume that a uh, relation consists of uh, one or more files and each file has a number of records in the file. Whether these are OS files or files managed by the database system is something we will ignore from here on. We are going to start with fixed length records and then move to variable length records. Fixed length records are extremely easy to store uh, because each field has a fixed size, the whole record has a fixed size. So you can treat the file as an array of bytes and record i starts from byte number uh, n times i minus 1 where n is the size of an individual record. So it's very easy to seek in that file to a particular record and read it. So record access is very simple. One uh, catch with this is that if this physical block uh, did not exactly match a multiple of the uh, record size, the last record in a block might be partly in this block, partly in another block. Uh, that can cause trouble for recovery and other algorithms. So usually what happens is you are willing to leave some free space at the end of a block, but don't allow a record to span two different blocks. Okay. So this is how you store the records, but records are dynamic. They may be deleted. What do you do if record three is deleted? Uh, again, from your data structure scores, you would know there are several alternatives. One is to move all the succeeding records up to fill the space. This is totally impractical for a large file, but it's also totally practical and is used when you just want to do it at the level of a single block. If this is just one block and you de delete record three, it's eminently possible to move the records at the back up or more commonly the records at the front are moved down to so that all the free space in the block is together at one spot. Or you can keep a linked list of free records and so forth. I won't get into the details. It's kind of shown here pictorially. These are the block, uh, the records which were deleted. They are now free. And you can start from the header and follow the next pointer values to find all the free blocks. And the last block has a null for its next uh, free record, which means that's the last free record in this particular block. So again, these are minor details. We won't make you too much use of it. Uh, but now I want to slow down a bit and talk about how databases store variable length records. Fixed length records are very easy. They date back to uh, data structures courses. But how do you store a variable length record? Also, how do you store records which may have null values? Okay, we'll answer both those questions in this diagram. So this particular thing is for an instructor record um, where we are assuming that the instructor ID name uh, and the uh, department name are all variable length strings while the salary is a fixed uh, length numeric or integer. So how is this stored in a record? So this whole thing is one single record. All the variable length fields, the actual data is stored at the tail end of the record. At the beginning of the record, you know, we know the first field is a ID and it's a variable length ID, let's say. Uh, I think in our actual declaration, we called it care 5, which we could store in line. But here we are assuming it's where care 5. Um, so uh, its length could vary. So what we do is we store two pieces of information at the beginning corresponding to the first field, that is ID. The first is an offset within this record where it starts. So there's a bunch of information. And the ID starts at byte 21, so I'm storing 21 there. The next is how many bytes does the ID occupy? It has five characters, five bytes. 
the next field is name that is also stored behind here. So, its starting point is by 26 and Srinivasan is a long name, its length is 10. And the third field is the department name that is also stored offline. So, its starting point is stored 36 and its length is 10 again. The fourth field is an integer, so it is stored uh, in line 65,000 here and that is 8 bytes of integer let us say. So, based on the schema declaration of uh, instructor, I know that these are all where care. So, I know that this is how it is going to be stored. So, let us say that these are uh, maybe uh, you know since pages are not all that big, this may be 2 bytes and 2 bytes each offset and length 2 plus 2 bytes that is 65 k page size. So, what I will have is 4 bytes for uh, the first field, 4 bytes for the next field and so on because they are all where care. Integer, uh, let us say I want large integers, uh, so I am storing 8 bytes. So, I know given the schema, I know exactly where in this first array of bytes to find the details of let us say the department name. I know based on the schema that it must start at byte number 8 and occupy 4 bytes and those 4 bytes have 2 bytes of offset and 2 bytes of length, which I then used to jump here and find the department name. There is one other piece of information which is the null bitmap and this records which all uh, of these um, attributes have a null value. Now, if you have where care, it is quite easy to store null values. Uh, all you do is uh, say that its length is 0, uh, that means there is no data, it is a null value. Uh, well, not quite, there is also a null string which is not exactly the same as a null value, the empty string. So, empty string would have length 0. Uh, what a, so, an actual null string could be represented maybe by an offset of 0. But for integers and numeric, you cannot do that here. So, you must have a bit which says, uh, which is set if that particular field is 1. So, here I am just showing 1 bit per field and if the salary was null, the fourth bit here would be set to null. Okay. So, let me uh, cover this last slide and then we will have time for some questions. So, the last slide that I have in this segment, there is more coming up, but in this segment is how do you store variable length records in pages. Earlier we had a fixed number of records per page, now we have a variable number of records per page and each record is of variable length. So, if I want to quickly access a record in a page, I need some structure for it and this particular structure called a slotted page structure is very commonly used. So, what it has is all the records are stored at the end of a page. That is, what do I mean end of a page? A page has uh, you know bytes starting from 0 to some number. So, typically the records are stored packed together without any gaps at the end of the page. At the beginning of the page on the other hand, I have a header which has several things. The first is the number of entries, that is uh, how many um, entries does a block header have. Each entry itself uh, has a size and an offset, meaning that uh, you know the first entry is for record 0, uh, which has some size and an offset, if you follow the offset is shown pictorially here as this line. What is actually stored is a value, it says this record 0 starts here, then record 1 starts here, uh, record 2 starts here, record 3 starts somewhere here and so forth. So, all the offsets are stored, the lengths are stored here. One extra piece of information is stored which is where does the free space end and that is this point, the free space ends here. Based on the number of entries, I can calculate where the free space begins. Uh, so, number of entries times this size per entry uh, plus the size of this header thing here together determine where the free space begins. So, if I want to create a new record, I just move the free space pointer back over here. So, now the free space is reduced and the new record has been allocated space here and entry is made for that record over here. What if the size of a, uh, well what if a record is deleted? I will uh, basically delete the entry here, say that this entry is no longer used, it is free. 
but I will also move all the records to fill in gaps. So if this record were deleted, these two records would move to fill in the space and free space expands, it is contiguous. When I move these, I have to update the offsets here. So that is uh, required. So there is some overhead to doing this. But the benefit is that free space is all together. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, memory allocation uh, systems in, uh, uh, you know, which are uh, come as uh, part of any language, malloc, free and equivalents in Java. Uh, one of the problems they run into is that they do not typically do compaction and the free space can get fragmented into many small pieces. Here, uh, the free space within a particular page is always together, so there is no fragmentation within a page. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that if you want to uh, mention a particular record inside a particular page, uh, this is a common requirement and uh, it is called a record ID typically. So a record ID identifies the page where the record is stored and an offset into this block header. You never store the physical location of the record because that can move around. And if you move it, you do not want to go update an index. Uh, and tell it that record moved within the page. What you do is in the index, you will store the page number and the offset within the block. And if you move the record here, you just update the this part, the starting location for the record and the index itself is not touched because the uh, you just go to the corresponding uh, entry in the block header and from there you can find the record. Even if it has, it has moved many times, it does not matter you go to that location, you will find the record. 